Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us on Sunday the 13th of December for this Nina WebEx. Uh, really do appreciate taking the time out of your day, uh, and hopefully you will find this hour a really informative and collaborative session. So just very quickly, uh, you'll notice that I've got three panellists with me, so I'd like to introduce Lamia, Sharifa and Asif, and they head up our Egypt, Oman and Bahrain uh, offices within the Middle East. And we'll be having very much an interactive session today. So there's going to be three polls. So again, we'd really like to hear some of your opinions. And then at the end of the presentation, we're really going to have that collaborative conversation. So if you have got any questions throughout this session, please feel free to drop it in the very bottom in the Q&A, and then we'll get to that going forward. So Thank you so much for joining. Uh, I know that it is a very busy time of the year for everyone, year end, closing out the year. So again, thank you so much. But I really do hope that you find this session really, really informative. So the topics we're going to be talking about today is cost containment and optimizing value. So what does that actually mean when consultants or HR, MMB consultants talk about this? Well, it's really understanding your benefit package. Is it fit for purpose? Is it value? Do employees understand it? Um, we know that holistic well-being package used to be a, a nice to have thing. And it used to be something that just HR was kind of in control of and sort of drove it. But we now know that the C-suite are taking real interest in this holistic well-being offering. So the conversation has matured conversation has gone in different directions. We're now talking finance, procurement, risk and mitigation, and employee benefits. So it really has evolved over the last few years. So this is where we are within 2020. So one thing when we talk about employee benefits and overall packages and holistic approaches is that we've got to make sure it's affordable. We've got to make sure it's sustainable we've got to make sure that employees are engaged in it because we've got to make sure that every single aspect of the wider employee benefit package is really, really looked at. Because we know the health and resilience of your people is indirectly linked to the health and resilience of your business. So in the next 30 minutes or so, I'm going to break this down into a little more tangible, a little bit more practical aspects that we can talk through. Next page, please. So first thing I'm going to talk about is kind of what's been happening on a macro level. What's been happening globally? How has 2020 changed? We all thought 2020, 20 years after the millennium, we thought this was going to be the big year of change. I don't think any of us had any idea of how much things have changed. So starting at the left and kind of working my way across. So the market volatility, what has happened financially? We know that a lot of our global clients, a lot of our regional clients are affected by what's happening on the global stock exchange. Currency issues, the price of the dollar, oil prices, all of that financial, refinancial, all of those financial aspects do affect all of us, no matter what industry we're in. We're talking cash flow, we're talking finances, profit, loss, etc. All of those things have changed within 2021. Unemployment. So again, unfortunately, for some of our clients at the beginning of lockdown, they, hit, they did sadly have to let some of their employees go. Um, luckily, what we're kind of seeing in the market was that that was that, that probably initial dramatic redundancy letting people go. But towards the end of the summer, as we're now going into winter, we've definitely seen the sort of the the leveling out, the sustainability of our workforce. And for some of our clients, they were actually on a growth spurt. So some of our food delivery people, uh, some of our um, hospital clients, they've really, really sort of strived and grown within this period. Digital, so again, digital health investment. Who would have thought that the advancements that we see in digital care, telemedicine, delivery of drugs, mental health support, digital support, all the tech, all the apps. Who would have thought that 2020 really would have been the year that we've seen so much more digital support? 
data and tech. So again, artificial intelligence, chain blocking, the advancement of the big data, understanding tech. New startups have started, new apps are being created. Um, we're looking at telemedicine. Now on the phone, you can speak to a doctor just on your smartphone. And a scary stat I read the other week, there's more iPhones in the world than there actually are people. So we know that the future is here. We know that we have to evolve and be part of the tech revolution. And then finally, health and well-being. So again, health and well-being has always been part of an HR agenda, but now we need to drill down, get some tangible studies, get a calendar in place, get some return on investment. And we're not just talking about wellness fairs anymore or doing the odd WebEx. We really want to invest in this health and well-being proposition. We want to understand that all our employees are different. A 20-year-old is different to a 40-year-old and everyone wants different things. So again, it's about that wider holistic wellness proposition. So it's physical health, mental health, social health and financial health. And this is just the beginning of this journey. Give it four or five years, health and well-being is really going to take off. And we're starting to see it with some of the conversations we're having with our clients. So I'm excited about it. And I hope you are excited about this journey that we're going to go on as well. Can go to the next page. Brilliant. So one thing we want to talk about today is health trends. And again, what is a health trend? A health trend is made up of four different factors. So if you've joined any of our WebExes previously or spoken to our client executives, we've talked medical inflation. But as a company, Mercer Marsh Benefits has taken this global approach that from 2020 onwards, we're gonna be talking health trends. So health trends is kind of this magical number that everyone talks about, but what really is it? So as you can see in the top of this slide, we've got some great stats around what is happening within the Middle East in terms of inflation versus health trends. And why is it sometimes three, four, five times higher than inflation? Why is that causing this? And I think one of the great stats that's come out of the Global Health Trend Report is the fact that 71% of insurers that we've chatted to do think that medical trend is going to increase from 2020 to 2021. So again, this is what the market's telling us, costs are going up. So what makes up the health trend? So as you can see at the bottom, we've got the four main factors. So the phrase that we've probably always talked about and you've probably heard of is medical inflation. So that's the, the average cost going up year on year. It's the hospital charges, the doctor's charges, the overall package, the kind of the medical treatment that's going up year on year. But what we also want to take into account, because again, we realize that may be quite singular. And again, we want to be taking this more holistic global approach. So there's also three new factors that you'll then see at the bottom of the page. So the first one is the change in treatment mix. So what does that mean? In reality, it's the change of behavior, it's that change of treatment. So we know in lockdown, hospitals weren't offering the elective inpatient treatment. They were delaying it, they were putting it off. Um, you had people that were scared to go into hospitals in case they caught infections or caught COVID, sort of all of those things. So realistically, what happens with that delay in treatment? So someone had cancer, God forbid. What happens if they caught it now at stage three, stage four, rather than stage one, stage two? Diabetes, you might have been diagnosed at pre-diabetic state. Now you're going to see your medical practitioner and you're diabetic. So it's kind of that delay in treatment, chronic heart diseases, rising chronic disease, uh, rising chronic conditions. What has lockdown in 2020 caused the general population? What are those consequences? Secondly, we've got the utilization change. So again, we're talking about change in behavior. So for some people in their 20s and 30s, there might not have been that fear of COVID. So they might have continued as normal. 
But for some of our older generations, 50s, 60s, 70s, for example, they would have delayed going into hospitals, delayed seeking advice. There might be a difference in terms of gender. So again, we know statistically women, females are more likely to go and seek medical support than males. So again, how has that changed? And then finally, it's the regulatory changes. So I just look back to six, seven months ago and the changes from the DHA had the different governments. So Bahraini, uh, Oman, Egypt, what did the government say? Who was paying for this? Is it insurers? Is it government? Is it a mixture? Who's paying for what invoices? There was all of that uncertainty at the beginning of lockdown. Now we understand where the stances are. But when you deep dive that a little bit more, there's probably a change in cost. So what about the extra PPE cost of protection, extra gloves, extra nurses, extra cleaning? All of those different things affect the medical trend. Can we go to the next slide. So now we're talking about what are the four main factors that really make up some key risk decisions when we look at data. So starting at the left hand side, we're kind of looking at the chronic diseases, the lifestyle diseases. So again, we've got an increase in cardiovascular, heart attacks, strokes, Alzheimer's, high blood pressure. We've got an increase in the metabolics. And again, that's more your diabetes, your type two diabetes. And again, the Middle East is renowned for having some scary type two diabetes stats. Um, we know that give it sort of 2023, in some countries, nearly a quarter of the population is going to have type 2 diabetes. And what we're starting to see is some of the consequences of type 2 diabetes. So the amputation, the blindness, the, the cardiovascular diseases, the consequences of the insulin resilience and, and the diabetic consequences. And again, when we think about occupational risk, we think of working from home ergonomics, musculoskeletal. I'm sitting at a desk, but is it properly assessed? How far away am I from the screen? So what's happening to my vision, my optical, duty of care, mental health, which then links us into the emotional support, the mental health support. So again, mental health, we are very much aware, is still a taboo for the Middle East. But I think one thing that 2020 has done is that it's actually brought mental health to the forefront of, insurer, uh, of insurers and employers' conversation. How do we support our employees? How do we ensure that they are of sound mind? We know that isolation is not good for human beings. We know that we are a socially adapt species. So it could be basic for being worried, am I going to catch corona? Am I going to keep my job? Am I going to lose my salary? What about my family and my friends back home? Do I have that social support here? So there's lots of variants when we talk about mental health. It's not just some of maybe medical conditions. It's the wider holistic things that, again, we need to be aware of. Because mental health affects your physical health. It affects your sleep patterns, your memory, your eating habits, drinking. All of those consequences can result from depression, anxiety, isolation. It then also came to our attention that for some countries, there were some kind of minor conditions where it came to children's diseases. Um, in Africa, there was a very big sort of under malnutrition. But when I think about Egypt and uh, Oman and Bahrain, et cetera, et cetera, Middle East, I think about air conditioning. I think that the fact that our children have not been designed, the lungs are not designed to breathe in air conditioning. Schools, malls, minibuses, home, we're breathing in this process there. How is that affecting their young bodies, their young lungs? And we know that asthma is definitely on the increase when we look at that data. Another thing that's kind of come to the forefront uh, when we look at sort of childhood diseases is autism, ADHD, behavioral issues that some of our clients are seeing within that claims data. So some of that is down to better diagnosis. Um, it's teachers, it's school, it's occupational nurses recognizing some of those early symptoms. But it's also the change in culture. It's 
do I need to go and get my child diagnosed? Do I need to go and seek a doctor's opinion on something? So again, it's that recognition, it's that maturity of sort of evolving. And then finally, it's kind of the safety uh, traffic incident sort of thing. Again, some countries have more of these sort of safety issues than others. But when I think about the Middle East, when I think about um, Egypt, Oman and, um, Oman and Bahrain, I think about road traffic. I mean, the amount of cars on the road, the traffic accidents you see, the ambulances, the police cars, the tow trucks, it can be very dangerous driving. So again, that's kind of when we talk about traffic incidences within the Middle East. We can go to the next slide. Okay, so we're now going to have our first poll. So this is where we would really like to start hearing some of your insights and your thoughts. So Valentina is going to throw up the quiz. Uh, so if you can just do our first poll. So for you, what are your key drivers of medical costs within your organization? Health risks, metabolic, cardiovascular, dietary diseases, emotional and mental support, childhood and malnutrition, traffic, violence, and safety. So if you can please just vote, we're then going to look at the results in a few moments. So we've had half of you voted, thank you very much. You can wait a few more moments. Brilliant, thank you. So, unresounding, all of you that have voted are saying that it's for health risks, it's lifestyle events, it's chronic diseases. Uh, Lamia, Sharifa, Asif, is that, is that kind of what you'd expect to see? I mean, of course, uh, this is, uh, if you look at the current trends and the last few years, uh, and especially in GCC, these have been the main uh, factors. Mm -hmm. uh, I would have expected maybe a couple of votes on emotional and mental issues as well. Uh, but I think this is only uh, uh, coming into light this year uh, mm -hmm. because of the uh, COVID situation. Okay. Otherwise, yes, it's uh, especially in the Middle East, cardiovascular diseases, uh, diabetes, uh, work pressure, mental tension, uh, smoking has been the main issues in the region. Yeah, I uh, I one thing though, uh, traffic has reduced due to COVID. <laughs> well, <we're good> <laughs> I think that's the positive side of uh, COVID-19, not having a bit yeah. of uh, traffic. Yeah, working from I home. Agree. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think and also what Asaf said, uh, the, those are the diseases and actually we started seeing it not only with, with the, our reports and change reports with the clients and stuff, but also it's starting to being more with our families and our mm -hmm. uh, and starting to hit the younger ages. Like we started to see like young men and young women uh, starting to have heart attacks and and angina and those kinds of stuff. So yeah, this is like an in, increase, increase. And uh, what Tasa said regarding the emotional and mental health issues, I, I think just because our, I mean, our culture is still new to, to those kind of attention. And we just realized that how important are they uh, just during this year, actually. So, but I think it's it's coming soon uh, into attention. This is what I, I see for coming here. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Great. So if we go to the next slide. OK, so I've given you some high level overview, some macro view, and some sort of real great sort of global and Middle East insights into what's happening. But us as MMB, us as your consultants, we really want to give you that practical aspect. So within the cost containment report, which I'll talk about towards the end, we've broken this down into three factors. So designing for value, managing your health risk, and driving efficiency. So if we go to the next slide. So we believe that there are three steps that clients and energy consultants need to address the value for money, the optimizing costs, if you're looking after employees. So that's how we've done, we've broken it down. So the first one is all about designing for value. And the way I think about it is that, is it still fit for purpose? Is this something that actually we've really looked at? Or is it just something that we've always had? We've always had this plan design. We've always had this network risk. 
We've always had these type of insurers that we've dealt with or these unique offerings from the insurers. Or do we suddenly just say, you know what? Blank bit of paper. Let's start again. Let's redesign for today's workforce. So that's kind of the first part of the team design. The second thing is all about identifying any risk gaps. So during COVID, during lockdown, did we notice something missing? Did we notice that pandemic cover was covered? Did we notice that access to digital health was covered? Or were there certain aspects? And another thing we talk about is kind of this whole market norm, this benchmarking. So for a lot of our clients, their view is, we just want to be mid-market. But what does mid-market look like now? What has the rest of your competitors done? And for some of our clients, they don't want to be mid-market. They need to attract certain new talent. They need to retain existing talent. So maybe they want to become an employer of choice. Maybe they want to increase their offerings. But what can they do? Uh, and then finally, it's making sure it's about quality of care, centers of excellence, driving that sort of pattern and that kind of footfall of where employees are going. So when we drill it down slightly more, we've kind of got these four aspects. So again, eligibility. We know obviously that medical insurance is compulsory within some countries, but for other countries, it's a must to have. So again, what's your eligibility ruling? If you had different gradings, have you always had these same gradings? What's kind of your stances around that? Digital, as I mentioned. So again, telemedicine is a new thing that's come to the US. Um, it's probably being kind of pushed forward because of COVID and lockdown, but what's being offered? Is it being insurer driven? Is it being clinic and uh, network driven? What's the offering that we're doing? Mental health, as I mentioned, again, we need to start this journey. We need to start having this safe environment where employers can talk about mental health. They can provide solutions. We can offer that safe space. I read this great article the other day, and it was all about mental health needs to be not career limiting. So again, it's removing that fear, removing that kind of taboo that maybe we might still have in the beliefs around mental health. And then finally, flexibility. So again, flexibility is a big, big word, but it is the whole idea that not one plan design will fit all, not one offering fits every different style of workforce. We've got Generation X, Millennials, we've got Baby Boomers, we've got so many different personas within the workforce that we need to start thinking, how are we giving optimal availability to different people? And again, this is where we talk about design for value. Go to the next page. So the second one is all about managing health risks. And when we think about this, it's mainly kind of in three separate factors. So the first one we talk about is preventative. So managing health risk, the word being risk, we know it's there. We know we cannot eliminate risk, but what we can do is try and control it. And one way of trying to control it is starting at the beginning. So instead of being reactive, let's be proactive. Let's think about how we can manage some sort of preventative measures. Health screenings, GP access, preventative cancer screenings, access to digital health, online health risk assessments, understanding your health. So a saying I always say over time is, how can I understand my health if I don't know my health? So again, do I have high blood pressure? Do I have some fat within my arteries? Do I, have, do I sleep enough? Some of these conditions don't give obvious symptoms. They don't give obvious illnesses that I would go and see a doctor for. But I know if I don't manage this, it's going to affect me long-term. So again, when we talk about long-term risk, something we call the wellness barrier. So within any employee population, there's going to be four groups of people. There's going to be your well populations, so the people that really engage in their health, where biometrics, go to the gym, et cetera. But the parts that we're really concerned about is the at-risk population. So again, these are employees with underlying health risks. They might be slightly overweight. They might have elevated heart pressure, 
they might be pre-diabetic, but they don't know about this. And we know that if some of those chronic diseases are not monitored now, if they're not stopped now, they're going to go into the ill category. So they're going to be start using the medical treatment. They're going to start going to the doctor. Chronic diseases, chronic medication. And again, once you're in that category, we know the utilization increases. We know cost increases. So why not look at it slightly different? Why not look at it as a preventative measure rather than a reactive? And again, it's understanding that data. So again, what raw data do we get? How does that data impact our risk? How does that compare to the market? How does that compare to my competitors? Where do I fit? What return on investment do I want? Where do I want to measure my risk? Next slide. And then finally, we look about driving efficiency. So again, we know that there is this cost. For some of our clients, they're spending millions of dollars, millions of dirhams on medical schemes every single year. So how do we be clever with this? How we can be smart and get this efficiency? So some of the conversations we're having with a client is looking at contracts. So again, challenge that status quo, challenge, oh, we've always done this type of attitude. Let's really evaluate what we've got and could we do it cleverer? Could we be smarter? So looking at a contract, does it need to be rewritten? Do we need to look at global underwriting, captive, pooling arrangements? Do we need to look at different payment terms? Instead of paying annually, we pay half annually, quarterly. Uh, payment length, instead of a 30-day in uh, invoice, why don't we look at a 90-day invoice? Why don't we look at the third billing, stop losses, profit sharing? Why don't we evaluate what we've got? For some of our clients, they're going a step further. So they're looking at dual insuring, dual benefits. Am I paying for something that's in the medical scheme as well as the life scheme? Am I paying for something that's in the medical scheme as well as the workman compensation? Thinking about um, medical costs for evacuation, uh, medical costs for transport. Some of those things, they might be in multiple insurance policies. Uh, and again, dual insurance, are they maybe insured under their partners, their spouse's plan and the employer sponsored plan? So again, looking at that. Um, fraud and abuse. We know that fraud and abuse is still an issue within the police. Not as bad as it was sort of 10 years ago or so, but it still is an issue. We know that insurers have got dedicated fraud and abuse teams within their departments. So again, what are we doing to evaluate that? How are we having the conversation with the insurers to check that they're monitoring high cost claims, to check that they're monitoring that the networks and the providers are doing what they're supposed to be doing. And another big thing about driving efficiency is about streamlining the HR process. So again, we know that some HR is being asked to do more less time, less headcount, less finances. So how can we ensure that you are doing what you should be doing, looking after the people strategy of your company? So again, we then have conversations about making benefits employee-centric, making sure that the employee is part of that journey in terms of responsibility, reliability, again, that self-service conversation. So that's something that we look at when we talk about driving efficiency. Next page. So we're now going to have our second poll of the day. So again, we'd love to hear your insights. So Valentina is going to bring up the poll. So first question we have here is, what are your key strategic investments and what are you considering for your organization? Data and analytics, care, focus, and value benefit plan design, provider management, digital health, including web care, self-service solutions, or wellness programs. So please feel free to click what you and your organization will be concentrating on at the moment and in the future. Thank you, and a few people vote so far.
Okay, so we have had 67% uh, who are voting for data and analytics. And then coming in uh, second is wellness programs. So again, Lamia, Asif and Sharifa, is that kind of typically what you're having conversations with with your local clients? Uh, wellness uh, is a very interesting topic. Uh, I mean, a lot of insurers uh, and uh, uh, consultants like us, we have been uh, focusing or uh, mentioning this for last couple of years. Uh, but I think it's only this year that people have started realizing that it's a very uh, important uh, aspect of your uh, overall healthcare package to your employees. Yeah. And uh, I think uh, uh, as an employer, it's your uh, responsibility in a way to educate your staff more about, about wellness uh, uh, initiatives and uh, at some level held, hold them responsible or accountable of their health. So yes, some solutions are uh, 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 not only the wellness sessions are maybe annual medical checkups, make them compulsory in your company. Uh, early deduction uh, of anything is better than um, knowing at a last stage. So uh, yes, data analytics and has always been uh, uh, as Marsh, and Mercer, it has been the most important thing for us to uh, make uh, educated decision uh, and that is most important. Uh, but I think yes, wellness is on rise now and uh, considering GCC is not as matured insurance market as if you look at uh, European uh, insurance uh, market, this is something we should uh, concentrate more on. And I think it's, it's a very uh, right time right now to start these initiative uh, and uh, uh, when you say wellness, it includes physical, mental, anything uh, which employees are in need of right now. Yeah, yeah and, and I think this is something that we have recently seen also in Oman. Uh, it was rarely um, asked by the client to have wellness sessions, but we have seen this from June uh, going forward that you know the client are emphasizing that this is something that needs to be in the policy itself as a major cover that they're willing to have. So definitely we do see that um, the clients are being more aware of the importance of having wellness uh, and uh, how to educate their, uh, their employees also to utilize these benefits, not only by having them. And uh, I think the data and analytics is, is really important uh, because it gives us an overview of what's happening within the organization, how best the employees are utilizing the benefits so definitely, this is something that uh, we see that in Oman, you know, um, we get a lot of queries in, in this. So totally, we can relate this to Oman. Yeah, um, for Egypt, I need to comment that for wellness programs, we actually started to highlight this like since last year before the COVID situation. Definitely this year, we realized it's, it's more important than we actually uh, advised. However, we've seen a lot of um, directions to where the digital health in Egypt. I know it's not included here, but, but since it's, it wasn't mature enough, uh, having the digital care. So it's, it's been highlighted this year a lot because the market lacked such service. So this is the most, like, the most requested thing, especially with the isolation and the work from home stuff. So I think this, this should be more like emphasized uh, uh, next. Yeah. yeah. And I think yes. this lockdown, I'm sorry, Afif. No, I mean, I totally agree with her. It's, uh, 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 it's a lot of clients we see have been asking about this, especially this year, uh, teleconsultation and all that. Uh, but unfortunately, I mean, uh, uh, Bahrain, I'm, I'm giving you an example of Bahrain. The market, the insurance products are not or were not ready for that. So we see a lot of movement now between insurers and provider to have digital solutions and uh, teleconsultation. So I think uh, uh, 2021 will have a totally different kind of market for us smaller GCC countries. Uh, I mean, if you compare, uh, UA definitely have a lot of solutions already in place uh, in terms of employee uh, EAP plans, uh, digital consultation, but uh, we as Bahrain or Oman, smaller countries, uh, we see a lot of movement within the insurance market now to implement these solutions. Yeah. And I think it's just exciting. I think what lockdown has, has brought to the market conversation is we can't do everything face to face. 
we've got to think about the future. We've got to think about digital. So that's probably like the one good thing that's sort of come out of 2020. Brilliant. Thank you, guys. So what we uh, were going to finalize and finally talk about is kind of what are the four key things that we feel that employers need to start thinking about in the future. So if you're thinking about your 2021 planning, um, HR KPIs, uh, even KPIs for some of your team members, we feel that these four aspects are something that our clients are starting to think about. So the first one is about claims uncertainty. So there's a great phrase within the report, none of us have a crystal ball. None of us know what 2021 is going to bring. Uh, we couldn't even imagine 2020 for what is going to be the consequences of COVID long term. Uh, but one thing we do know, again, from the Health Trend Survey report, is that 71% of insurers do believe that costs are going to increase in 2021 compared to 2020. So therefore, we've got to advise our clients to budget. We've got to start asking for more money from finance because this is going to be happening. Um, one thing that's sort of come into the effect and probably in the last 24, 48 hours is vaccine programs. So, so I'm based in Dubai uh, and news came out yesterday about the Shifeng in, um, vaccine. And again, come from China, they have a vaccine available. Uh, it's on a voluntary basis on the moment. Uh, it's been free, the UAE government's paying for it. Think bigger, think a month down the line, two months down the line. Are you allowed to go to work without a vaccine certificate? Are you allowed to get on a flight? Are you allowed to go to the supermarket or malls? What is the consequence of the vaccine program? Um, what we also are talking about when we talk about claims uncertainty is what we're phrasing the long-term effects. So unfortunately for those that have had COVID, what is the reality of the long-term effects for stress? lung capacity, heart capacity. Uh, we're hearing stories about uh, tiredness and sort of just being under the weather. So again, what is going to be some chronic diseases that come out of COVID? Uh, potentially mental health issues. Again, what is that long-term effect of people having issues in 2020? What's that going to look like in 2021? We then talk about cost control and delivering value and managing risk. Uh, and again, it kind of boils down to looking for the future. What is fit for the future? What do you want to design for 2021? Uh, what about your workforce? So I kind of mentioned earlier, we've got different workforce, different ages within our organizations. I think of our grad scheme, they're all 22, 23, 24, this is Generation X. This is a generation that has grown up on smartphones, grown up on the internet. We need to make sure that the medical uh, market, the HR market, our consultative market is keeping up with modern day lives. So again, what will be new? What will be the new things that come in? Um, we need to talk about this more holistically. So again, we talk about data, we talk about understanding claims risk. If we take a bigger picture, where does that fit in with health and safety, occupational health, um, employer work and compensation mitigation? How does that affect the bigger holistic risk that we do need to be looking at and think about this for our workforces? And finally, it's about smart financing. So again, as I mentioned earlier, challenge the status quo, challenge the existing contract. We need to start thinking again, re-evaluating it. Thirdly, we're talking about this phrase. So our new sort of strap line that hopefully you guys would have seen on LinkedIn and our social media is we want benefits that truly benefit. So how do we make sure that the employee understands their offering? We want them to value it, appreciate it, and realize actually my company offers me a great package. It's not just something I'm entitled to and just something that sits there along with a sick pay policy, but really understand the wider holistic HR policies that HR spends so much time on it. 
we really want them to start respecting it and appreciating it. Um, benefits that truly benefit. So again, just as, as has said and Sharif has said, potentially in Bahrain and Oman, the insurers were like, we need to bring digital, we need to do teleconsultation. This will happen within 2021. So again, what's available? Let's challenge the status quo. Let's make sure that the insurers really start engaging in what is needed in today's modern workforce. Um, it's about making things flexible. Uh, it's talking about sort of the wider flexible working, working from home. Um, we really, really need to start thinking about the diverse work groups that we work within. Again, it's about that employee-centric program. And then finally, probably the one that I get most excited about is challenging. Let's just challenge everything. So again, why keep things the same? Challenge the status quo. Imagine you've got a blank piece of paper and you've got HR, finance, procurement, op health, C-suite. Let's design, let's really put down on paper what do we want our employee benefit strategy to be? Let's just start from scratch. Let's not have these historical schemes in place, but let's just really think, what do we need for 2021? And not just for the next year, but the next five years, 10 years, 15 years. Let's start thinking about that long-term uh, jeopardy we really want to start offering. And for some of our clients, it's about returning to the office. Um, so again, thinking about, go back on here, just thinking about how do I return to the office? How do I make things safe for my staff? Um, we know we're going to have this vaccine. We know we're going to have total uh, herd immunization. But between now and, and then, five months, maybe six months, what are we doing? How are we making sure the office is safe? How are we taking on that responsibility of that safe environment? Uh, and again, we want to start challenging. We want to start questioning the state of play. Thank you, Valentina. So hopefully over the last sort of 30 minutes or so, I've, I've kind of given you an insight into what these two great reports talk about. So again, it is balancing costs and emphasizing employee benefits. And then again, benefits that truly benefit the insurer perspective, which is all about the health trend surveys. Um, both of these will be available from tomorrow to download. Uh, for those that have listened, you will, you will be getting an email about where you can download it from our intranet site. But going forward, our MLB consultants will be talking about these two points of view reports and really kind of pulling out where are you with this journey? Where's your pinpoint? So I've not done these reports justice. Uh, there is multiple bits of information in there. So please, please feel free to read. And then finally, we've just got the last poll here. So what topics are you most interested for 2021? So again, thinking about what I've just said, what would you like to start working on? What do you really want to target and sort of really concentrate on for 2021? So using data to understand employee behavior and utilization, cost containment strategies, digital health, solutions or employee engagement and well-being. So please just feel what do you want to concentrate on in the future? Brilliant, I'll just leave it a couple more moments, but I think you can kind of see where this is going. Brilliant. So 60% of you are saying that what we want to concentrate on within 2021 is really using and understanding data to understand employee behavior and utilization. And then coming in joint second is the digital health solutions and employee engagement and wellness. Um, so, Lamia, Azov and Sharifa, is that kind of what you're expecting? Uh, for me, yeah, I think one interesting thing, so our, our clients that sort of are on, no one put cost containment solutions. So again, we are thinking holistically when we talk about employee benefits. 
Mr. I mean, all those four points are important. I mean, this is, uh, uh, we have clients, uh, uh, I think I can divide them in two categories during 2020. Uh, there are clients who are, because of the current situation and economic situation, very focused on cost and uh, important for their business flow as well. And then there are clients uh, who are not even asking for marketing. Continue as is, don't change anything. We want to see one more year. Yeah. Uh, so uh, yes, cost containment, although it's uh, uh, a very important point. Yes, no, nobody had clicked in this session. Uh, I think everything is important. I mean, data analytics has been always important in the last few years, especially uh, since uh, uh, employees, uh, employers are more uh, into what they are expend, what they are spending their money on. They want to know. Uh, digital solutions has have been highlighted this year because of the situation, and something new which was not in this region earlier is employee engagement. Uh, and when you can bring that through employee communication, wellness session, and uh, uh, other means. Uh, but uh, I mean, all these points are important. Uh, we have seen the division in clients. Uh, there are companies, smaller organization, uh, which are more than ever worried about cost. And then we have more mid to large size or multinational accounts where there is uh, uh, data analytics and uh, employee engagement has been more important than cost. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of the conversation is evolving. It's yes. HR is asking for more data. I need to understand what's happening in order to- I mean, I'll give you an example. Uh, 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 normally, uh, we do coverage benchmarking reports for our clients and uh, don't see much change over the period of even six months or a uh, year or even sometimes like even two years reports will show the similar kind of uh, coverage level for certain industries. But in this, uh, in 2020, we have seen our benchmarking report is now being updated every month. Uh, uh, clients have started to uh, play around with their benefit, what matters most, what is what they need to provide to their members now. Uh, are they paying for coverage, which is not relevant to them? So we have seen table of benefits, the coverage levels been changing a lot. Uh, like renewals mm -hmm. we have done so far this year, uh, I think more than 50% of our clients have changed their policies according to needs now. Brilliant, thank you, Asif. So we're now going to go to the final slide. So hopefully we're gonna hear from all of our attendees, so clients that are on the call. So again, just to remind everyone, please feel free to put anything in the Q&A. Uh, if you would like to direct any questions to myself directly or to Lamia Asif and Sharifa, there is the email address there. But I would just like to say thank you very much. Uh, Subi, we've already had a question come in, so thank you. So to the panelists, so maybe Lamia, how can we reduce the tension of the employees so that they don't panic, so they don't panic about COVID-19? So what, so what advice would you give on that question? Actually, we've been there, okay. Definitely uh, now it's much better than the first wave. We had our, our like, aggressive first wave here in Egypt, it was back in June. What mainly uh, caused the panic is not understanding what's going on or not understanding what, how are the providers responding to the cases or how is the insurance market understanding because everything back then was more like uh, it's new decisions. Like we didn't cover pandemic, now we do. Uh, it used to be by the government, now we have private hospitals. So it would help a lot first to understand what's how providers are providing their treatments, what are the protocols, how is insurance handling the, the investigations, the isolation and those kinds of stuff. So first of all, understanding how, how the market and how the medical providers uh, contain such uh, condition and starting uh, uh, direct the employees on, on how is the insurance covering it and how are the, the hospitals covering, what are the severe cases that we need to uh, uh, work on what are the mild cases that just need isolation and those kind of stuff. So I think understanding first, and then we can direct the employees to what to upon their needs to what's needs to be done. Yeah, 
Sharifa, have you, did you have many sort of panicking clients in Oman and sort of what can we do? So how can we help with that engagement and that education of our employees? So I suppose the wider mental health, empathy, support. Yes. Yeah, I, I believe that, you know, knowledge is power. And more than anything, we should provide a lot of insight and information about what's happening around us, uh, especially like in Oman. Uh, what is the cover that we are having for COVID-19? So that, you know, at least a lot of people do get tensed when they feel like, you know, we are not covered or am I really covered to the fully or how can I, how best can I utilize the coverage that I have? Because this is the questions that we have been seeing in Oman uh, recently from, from a majority of our clients that, you know, how best can we address the issues uh, with the employees? So I believe, first of all, we need to listen as well to the employees, like really what's there that is creating a lot of attention to them. So what's really worrying uh, the employee? Is it the cover that they're wor worried about? Is it the unemployment? Is it the situation around them? And how best you know we can provide information and what's happening within the market uh, to address these um, concerns that they're having and to emphasize on the coverage that they're having towards whether this is COVID-19 or how best they can utilize even the wellness sessions. It could be that the employees do have uh, uh, you know, a support because we have seen more than anything, it's about the emotional aspects that we need to handle in this situation. So how best we can address this? Who are the right people that they can talk to? Uh, so having more conversations with, with these employees to understand exactly where the issue is coming from and uh, how best to address it. Um, I think that's, that, that's how we have been doing it in Oman, uh, just listening to them and understanding where the issues is, is coming from. Uh, I think uh, uh, in sh a very short statement, we can divide this into three uh, different supports. One is more communication with your employees, uh, be open and transparent. Uh, second stage is wellness session around mental health. And we have seen companies who do uh, have or are looking into it uh, in setting up employee assistant programs. Yeah. Um, EAP, like uh, this is where uh, individual member can call in and discuss any mental health or any issues uh, yeah. uh, by keeping keeping their identity also uh, uh, during employment, what you have discussed. So yeah, this is a, something which we have seen uh, a lot of clients are now asking about. Uh, it's uh, something not available previously or something that was not available pre previously in the region, uh, but has been all uh, offered by in insurers of uh, like international insurers. Uh, but I think uh, we, we are seeing uh, more and more local companies are now looking toward this employee assistant programs. Yeah. So it's about the market evolving. It's about the market offering more digital solutions, employee centric. But I think the big thing I'm hearing is kind of engagement understanding what the employees need, making sure that they appreciate it and kind of really driving that value. So, yeah. so any, any more questions that would like to come through? We have had one more that came through prior. Um, so on a, on a personal level, so Lamia, uh, Asif and Sharifa, how would you like to see your local market evolve in 2021? What conversations do you think you'll be having with your clients and kind of what do you want to drive sort of from the market, from the conversation, from insurers? What would you like to see the future look like? Um, uh, for us here in Egypt, I really would like to start like, again, the digital healthcare. It's a couple of providers now like do it, but still it needs more evolving and needs more spreading among the rest of the providers and definitely the, the mental mental and health and, and wellness. This definitely needs to have some highlight on for next year and needs more solutions to be provided. Yeah. yeah. And consultancy. So again, for a lot of our clients, they don't know where to start. They don't know what they should be offering. So again, it's having conversations with us about how to design that pathway, how to start that journey. So yeah. Yeah, and uh, I think in Oman, um, we have really uh, great news that um, 
the Capital Market Authority has already launched a digital platform where all the providers will be using. So definitely that's a, a very positive note to see that, you know, it's not only coming from the providers, but from the authority as well. The platform is going to be launched in July, 2021. So everything will be digitalized. And uh, I think that's really the way forward, uh, not only for Oman, but for most of the GCC countries going forward. And we hope that, you know, this will help once the mandatory health is already uh, mandatory. Uh, a lot of flexibilities will be there. And uh, more, I think more emphasizing on, on the data analytics, this, this will help us. And not only that, but we can see that a lot of people are now requesting a lot of wellness. So I believe this is something that we will be emphasizing going forward in 2021 um, to have more flexibility benefits that we started introducing earlier this year. So we hope that, you know, uh, by next year, maybe, um, this would be um, a solution that we will provide to our clients to have more flexible benefits. And uh, we hope that, uh, you know, um, it will be received on a, a positive note because we, we already started it and, and we think uh, clients are really appreciating, um, you know, uh, this sort of initiative. So hopefully uh, this will be there as well. And Asif, how would you like to see Bahrain market evolve? No, I would like to continue from what Sharifa said, more flexible benefits. No, uh, GCC, uh, we have seen in many countries and it's, uh, you know, everyone is working on that, compulsory health insurance. A minimum level of health insurance is being implemented in every country here. And uh, having a option for employees, individuals, to top up those plan on on top of the compulsory minimum required limits what they feel are more important for them so this flexible benefit kind of approach i think is the future uh, we as marsh have been in discussion with local bahraini insurance companies to work on this it's not available again uh, here uae has some solutions on that uh, but i think uh, uh, this flexible benefits where uh, each employee each member can purchase the coverage which he or she feels is more important to them yeah. uh, is going to be a very important solution for future. Uh, wellness is, as mentioned, uh, we have seen the importance of wellness this year. Uh, so insurers yeah. are uh, working with us in developing such plans. Uh, I think digital and wellness and option yeah. to choose, these three will be a future of the industry. I think that I think it's the future of the GCC. We we have yeah. to the medical insurance market has to keep up with what is happening. Uh, think of banking, uh, think of food delivery, all of that now, kind of that disruption tech, all of that is kind of available. So I just wanted to thank my panelists, Lamia, Sharifa, and Asif. Thank you so much for giving us the local insight in Egypt, Bahrain, and Oman. Uh, you bring great insights. Uh, so I just want to thank you so much for your participation today. Uh, for the clients that are on, I really, really hope that you found today's session insightful, thought provoking. Um, but honestly, I did not do these reports justice. They are a reports that are so full of information, so detailed. So please feel free to read them when they come through. They are honestly a joy to read. Uh, so I just want to say thank you very much for today. Um, for those of you uh, that are working, please get back to work. Uh, but I just want to say thank you so much again for everyone listening. And we look forward to doing more of these WebExes and panel shows within 2021. So please look out for those invites. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.